Hey guys. All right. So today we're going to be learning about metals. So let me see if I can get this pulled up. There we go. All right. So what are some things you think about when you think about metals like gold, silver, and copper? So probably you think they're really shiny. Um, they're often using like wires. They're expensive. So, um, we're going to be looking at properties of metals today. So we're going to be looking at vocabulary, alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals, the lanthanides, and the actinides. All right, so here's some vocabulary terms. So malleable means you can flatten it into a thin sheet. So you can smash it down and it's not going to break. Ductile means you can turn it into a wire, like a copper wire. Conductor means that it can transmit heat, electricity, and sound. Um, luster or lustrous means shiny and corrosive means to eat away at something. So we're going to see all of these terms used with metals. All right. So just looking at, um, a couple of vocabulary things. So here's a picture of malleability. So malleability is like taking this chunk of gold and flattening it into a gold coin. Gold is actually the most malleable metal. Um, it's very easy to manipulate. It's very easy to flatten and turn it into something like press it down. Unfortunately, that also means it's very soft, which means that it doesn't hold its shape as well. So gold isn't very durable, which is why we don't use it for building things. We mainly just use gold for decorative things. Although gold is used for, uh, wiring like in cell phones. Ductile means you can turn it into wires. So like this copper wire or the steel cable right here. Uh, metals are also good conductors of electricity and heat. So this is why you don't ever leave a metal spoon in a hot pot of boiling water. Um, they're very good conductors. And basically what happens with conductors is the electrons inside those atoms of the metals can flow very freely. So they're just cruising along. Nothing is inhibiting these electrons from moving. And so they're just doing their thing. So metals, electrons flow very freely. They're very good conductors, which is why we like to use them in wiring. Now we don't like touching them. So we do put some sort of insulator around them. Uh, metals are also lustrous, meaning that they're shiny, like these gold and silver coins. And some metals can actually be corroded. So um, acids and bases and other agents can actually eat away at metals. So you'll see some pictures of like corrosion here. Um, here's an example of what corrosion might look like in a lab. So, um, in a few weeks we'll get to, um, types of chemical reactions and we'll actually start to see the, uh, metal being corroded by the acid. So you see all these little bubbles, that's hydrogen gas being produced. And hydrogen gas is extremely explosive. So we'll actually get to see something like that, maybe in the spring semester. All right, so then we have the alkali metals. All right, so this is the first group on the periodic table. It is, um, if you are looking at the periodic table, it is column one. Now, hydrogen is not included with the alkali metals, hydrogen is actually a non-metal. So the alkali metals are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. So the alkali metals are very reactive. They are never found in their elemental form. They are only ever found with, uh, bound up to something else. So they're only found in compound form. The reason why they're so reactive is because they only have one valence electron and they will do literally anything to get rid of that one valence electron. So that, that electron is usually easily lost and it forms a plus one cation. We'll learn more about cations and anions in a couple weeks here. So the alkali metals have the classic properties of metals in that they're malleable, ductile, they're good conductors. However, they are softer than most other metals. So the alkali metals can actually be cut with a knife for the most part, like just a simple butter knife. And they can explode if they come into contact with water. So I'm going to post a link on Google Classroom 
uh, with a video that you can watch if you want to about what happens when the alkali metals come into contact with water. And it's actually a pretty cool video, so I would recommend watching it. All right, so here's just um, how the ions form. So if you remember from the Bohr diagrams that we did earlier, uh, there's only one valence electron for group one. So basically the option is we can either get seven more to fill up this outer ring or we can just X out that one. It's a lot easier to just X out that one. So it goes away. Here's some uses for the alkali metals. So lithium is often used in batteries, like lithium ion batteries. It's also used to treat um, bipolar disorder. Sodium is often used as lye, sodium hydroxide. Um, lye, like L-Y-E, it's a soap. It's, used with, it's what's used to make soap. Um, sodium is also one of the major neurotransmitters in the body. So um, if you remember, my major was neurobiology. So without sodium, the neurons and the neural synapses can't form so that you can't relay the information from, like, say, your fingers to your brain. So you got to have the right amount of sodium in your body to be able to get those signals from your nerve endings to the brain where it can process the feeling. Um, potassium is another alkali metal that's commonly used. Um, it's often found in potassium nitrate, which is fertilizer, which is also explosive. Um, potassium is also used for water control, um, which is why athletes sometimes have problems with it, like if they don't get hydrated enough. And it's also uh, for nerve impulses, especially in the heart region. Next up, we have the alkaline earth metals. So now we're in group two. Okay, so first we had the alkaline metals in group one. Now we're going on to the alkaline earth metals in group two. These are very similar to their cousins in group one, except for these have two valence electrons because they're in column two. They are still very reactive, but not quite as reactive as the alkali metals. They're still never found alone in nature. You can't just go mine calcium and then just find a hunk of calcium. It's always bound up to something else. Um, the group one and two elements are especially reactive with halogens and water. And they are shiny, silvery white. They have a low density, low melting and boiling points, and classic malleable and ductile. So here's just some pictures of some of the alkaline earth metals. Uh, this one right on here is strontium. So you can see they're all kind of that silvery white color. Uh, the alkaline earth metals are often used in fireworks to produce different colors. Um, magnesium can also be used to make things that need to be really durable, like planes, trains, cars, uh, spacecraft, things that you really don't want them to break right when you need them to but you might also want them to be lightweight. Our bones, we've all, we've all heard the got milk ads. Um, our bones need calcium to keep them strong. Next up, we come to the transition metals. And I like to call these the rebels of the periodic table because they don't follow the rules. So groups one and two, they had a, a, a pattern, one valence electron, two valence electrons. When we get to the transition metals, they kind of just go all over the place. So they have typical metallic properties. They're ductile, they're malleable, they're good conductors. And that's about where the similarities stop. Um, the thing with the transition metals is they can have valence electrons all over the place. They can change where their valence electrons are. They can change how many valence electrons they have. It changes a lot. They're also not as reactive as the alkali metals. So they don't explode, but they do form a lot of compounds. And when they do, they're usually colored. So like cobalt produces like brilliant blues. Um, copper produces green, like the Statue of Liberty. Um, those are the two that come to mind really fast. They're usually very dense, very hard, very heavy, like iron. We think of iron and we think big weights. Um, they usually have high melting and boiling points, which means usually these are pretty tough solids. But of course, there's got to be an exception. Mercury. So mercury is a liquid at room temperature. It is the only transition metal 
at room temperature. Um, it's only metal that's a liquid at room temperature. So that's why we preferred in thermometers is a great conductor, but it's also a liquid. Um, we used to prefer it in thermometers. Now, one of the caveats of mercury is that it is toxic, um, especially to the brain. So mercury can actually make you go a little crazy. Um, so we've tried to shy away from mercury thermometers in the past few years because it is really dangerous to humans and the environment. And so we just try to shy away from it. We've switched over to alcohol-based thermometers instead. Um, there are also three transition metals that are magnetic, and you do need to know these. So they are iron, cobalt, and nickel. So those are the three magnetic transition metals. Finally, we come to the rare earth metals. So the rare earth metals, or the lanthanides and the actinides, are at the bottom of the periodic table. So they're in these bottom two rows down here. And basically what happened was they would have taken up more page or more space on the page and caused us to have two pages of the periodic table. So they cut them out and pasted them at the bottom. So the lanthanides are supposed to be in period six between groups three and four. The actinides right below that period seven between groups three and four. So here's the lanthanides. And I'm just going to go over these real quick. So the lanthanides um, have high melting points. They can burn to form oxides. Um, these are found in sand sometimes, and they're mostly solids. Um, some are used in TV screens or speakers. Some of them can give color, like a rosy or something color, to glass and ceramics. Then we have the actinides on the bottom. And the actinides, uh, most of them we don't talk about too often. They're very radioactive for the most part. Um, usually when we're talking about the actinides, we're talking about uranium or plutonium because those are used for nuclear fuel. We, we learn a lot about uranium. Um, thorium is another one. This one actually can spontaneously combust in air. So it'll just like catch on fire by itself. Um, and curium is actually so radioactive that it glows purple. So that's pretty cool. Um, some other uses for the actinides. Americium is used in smoke detectors. We talked about that one with the isotopes. Californium is used to kill cancer cells. Plutonium and uranium, again, are used as fuel in nuclear reactions. All right. And that is about it for the metals. So um, go ahead and finish up the questions and then make sure to turn in your Ed Puzzle.